the 1948 Arab-Euro-Israeli War or the first Arab-Euro-Israeli War was fought between the State of Israel and a military coalition of Arab states and Palestinian Arab forces. This war formed the second stage of the 1948 Palestine War, known in Arabic as Al-Nakba and in Hebrew as the Milkhemet Ha'atzmaut or Milkhemet Hashikra. There had been tension and conflict between the Arabs and the Jews, and between each of them and the British forces, ever since the 1917 Balfour Declaration and the 1920 creation of the British Mandate of Palestine. British policies dissatisfied both Arabs and Jews. The Arabs' opposition developed into the 1936 Euro 1939 Arab Revolt in Palestine. The Jewish resistance developed into the Jewish insurgency in Palestine. These ongoing tensions erupted on November 30, 1947 into civil war between the Arab and Jewish populations in response to the UN partition plan to divide Palestine into three areas, an Arab state, a Jewish state and the special international regime for the city of Jerusalem. On May 15, 1948 the ongoing civil war transformed into an interstate conflict between Israel and the Arab states. A combined invasion by Egypt, Jordan and Syria, together with expeditionary forces from Iraq, entered Palestine, Jordan having declared privately to Aisha emissaries on May 2 it would abide by a decision not to attack the Jewish state. The invading forces took control of the Arab areas and immediately attacked Israeli forces and several Jewish settlements. The ten months of fighting, interrupted by several truce periods, took place mostly on the former territory of the British Mandate and for a short time also in the Sinai Peninsula and southern Lebanon. As a result of the war the State of Israel retained the area that the UN General Assembly Resolution 181 had recommended for the proposed Jewish state and also took control of almost 60% of the area allocated for the proposed Arab state, including the Jaffa, Lida and Ramla area, Galilee, some parts of the Negev, a wide strip along the Tel Aviv-Jerusalem Road, West Jerusalem, and some territories in the West Bank. Transjordan took control of the remainder of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and the Egyptian military took control of the Gaza Strip. No Arab-Palestinian state was created. In 1949 all the belligerents, except the Iraqis and the Palestinians, signed the 1949 Armistice Agreements. The conflict triggered important demographic changes in the area and through the Middle East. Around 700,000 Palestinian Arabs fled or were expelled from the area that became Israel and they became Palestinian refugees. In the three years following the war, about 700,000 Jews immigrated to Israel with one-third of them having fled, or having been expelled, from their previous countries of residence in the Middle East. Background the General Assembly resolution on partition was greeted with overwhelming joy in Jewish communities and widespread outrage in the Arab world. In Palestine, violence erupted almost immediately, feeding into a spiral of reprisals and counter-reprisals. The British refrained from intervening as tensions boiled over into a low-level conflict that quickly escalated into a full-scale civil war. From January onwards, operations became increasingly militarized with the intervention of a number of Arab Liberation Army regiments inside Palestine, each active in a variety of distinct sectors around the different coastal towns. They consolidated their presence in Galilee and Samaria. ABD al-Qadir al husseini came from Egypt with several hundred men of the Army of the Holy War. Having recruited a few thousand volunteers, al husseini organized the blockade of the 100,000 Jewish residents of Jerusalem. To counter this, the Ayishiv authorities tried to supply the city with convoys of up to 100 armored vehicles, but the operation became more and more impractical as the number of casualties in the relief convoys surged. By March, al husseinis tactic had paid off. Almost all of Haganah's armored vehicles had been destroyed, the blockade was in full operation, and hundreds of Haganah members who had tried to bring supplies into the city were killed. The situation for those who dwelt in the Jewish settlements in the highly isolated Negev and north of Galilee was even more critical. While the Jewish population had received strict orders requiring them to hold their ground everywhere at all costs, the Arab population was more affected by the general conditions of insecurity to which the country was exposed. Up to 100,000 Arabs, from the urban upper and middle classes in Haifa, 
Jaffa and Jerusalem, or Jewish-dominated areas, evacuated abroad or to Arab centers eastwards. The situation caused the U.S. to withdraw their support for the partition plan, thus encouraging the Arab League to believe that the Palestinian Arabs, reinforced by the Arab Liberation Army, could put an end to the plan for partition. The British, on the other hand, decided on February 7, 1948, to support the annexation of the Arab part of Palestine by Transjordan. Although a certain level of doubt took hold among Ayishiv supporters, their apparent defeats were due more to their wait-and-see policy than to weakness. David Ben-Gurion reorganized Haganah and made conscription obligatory. Every Jewish man and woman in the country had to receive military training. Thanks to funds raised by Goldemu from sympathizers in the United States, and Stalin's decision to support the Zionist cause, the Jewish representatives of Palestine were able to sign very important armament contracts in the East. Other Haganah agents recuperated stockpiles from the Second World War, which helped improve the army's equipment and logistics. Operation Balak allowed arms and other equipment to be transported for the first time by the end of March. Ben-Gurion invested Yigel Yadin with the responsibility to come up with a plan of offense whose timing was related to the foreseeable evacuation of British forces. This strategy, called Planned Elit, was readied by March and implemented towards the end of April. A separate plan, Operation Naction, was devised to lift the siege of Jerusalem. 1,500 men from Haganah's Jabati Brigade and Palmchis Harrell Brigade conducted sorties to free up the route to the city between 5th and 20th April. Both sides acted offensively in defiance of the partition plan, which foresaw Jerusalem as a corpus separatum, under neither Jewish nor Arab jurisdiction. The Arabs did not accept the plan, while the Jews were determined to oppose the internationalization of the city, and secure it as part of the Jewish state. The operation was successful, and enough foodstuffs to last two months were trucked into to Jerusalem for distribution to the Jewish population. The success of the operation was assisted by the death of al hajani in combat. During this time, and independently of Haganah or the framework of planned elite, irregular troops from Ergun and Lerni formations massacred a substantial number of Arabs at Du Yassin, an event that, though publicly deplored and criticized by the principal Jewish authorities, had a deep impact on the morale of the Arab population and contributed to generate the exod of the Arab population. At the same time, the first large-scale operation of the Arab Liberation Army ended in a debacle, having been roundly defeated at Mishma Haim, coinciding with the loss of their Druze allies through defection. Within the framework of the establishment of Jewish territorial continuity foreseen by planned Elit, the forces of Haganah, Palmch and Ergun intended to conquer mixed zones. Palestinian Arab society was shaken. Tiberias, Haifa, Seft, Besan, Jaffa and Acre fell, resulting in the flight of more than 250,000 Palestinian Arabs. The British had, at that time, essentially withdrawn their troops. The situation pushed the leaders of the neighboring Arab states to intervene, but their preparation was not finalized and they could not assemble sufficient forces to turn the tide of the war. The majority of Palestinian Arab hopes lay with the Arab Legion of Transjordan's monarch, King Abdullah I, but he had no intention of creating a Palestinian Arab-run state, since he hoped to annex as much of the territory of the British Mandate for Palestine as he could. He was playing a double game, being just as much in contact with the Jewish authorities as with the Arab League. In preparation for the offensive, Haganah successfully launched operations Yifta and Ben Ami to secure the Jewish settlements of Galilee, and Operation Kilshan, which created a united front around Jerusalem. The inconclusive meeting between Goldemu and Abdullah I, followed by the Kfarezian massacre on May 13 by the Arab Legion, led to predictions that the battle for Jerusalem would be merciless. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of the State of Israel and the 1948 Palestine War entered its second phase with the intervention of the Arab State Armies and the beginning of the 1948 Arab-Euro-Israeli War. Armed Forces By September 1947 the Haganah had 10,489 rifles, 702 light machine guns, 2,666 submachine guns, 186 medium machine guns. 
672 2-inch mortars and 92 3-inch mortars. Importing arms, in 1946, Ben Gurion decided that the Ayishif would probably have to defend itself against both the Palestinian Arabs and neighboring Arab states and accordingly began a massive, cover arms acquisition campaign in the West, and acquired many more during the first few months of hostilities. The Ayishib managed to clandestinely amass arms and military equipment abroad for transfer to Palestine once the British blockade was lifted. In the United States, Ayishib agents purchased three B-17 bombers, one of which bombed Cairo in July 1948, some C-46 transport planes, and dozens of half-tracks, which were repainted and defined as agricultural equipment. In Western Europe, Haganah agents amassed 50 65 mm French mountain guns, 12 120 mm mortars, 10 H-35 light tanks, and a large number of half-tracks. By mid-May or thereabouts the Ayishev had purchased from Czechoslovakia 25 Messerschmitt Me-109s, 200 heavy machine guns, 5,021 light machine guns, 24,500 rifles, and 52 million rounds of ammunition, enough to equip all units, but short of heavy arms. The airborne arms smuggling missions from Czechoslovakia were codenamed Operation Balak. The Ayishev also had a relatively advanced arms producing capacity, that between October 1947 and July 1948 produced 3 million 9 mm bullets, 150,000 mils grenades, 16,000 submachine guns and 210 3 inch mortars, along with a few Davidka mortars, which had been indigenously designed and produced. They were inaccurate but had a spectacularly loud explosion that demoralized the enemy. A large amount of the munitions used by the Israelis come from the Ayalon Institute, a clandestine bullet factory underneath Kibbutz Ayalon, which produced about 2.5 million bullets for Sten guns. The munitions produced by the Ayalon Institute were said to have been the only supply that was not in shortage during the war. Locally produced explosives were also plentiful. After Israel's independence, these clandestine arms manufacturing operations no longer had to be concealed, and were moved above ground. All of the Haganah's weapons manufacturing was centralized and later became Israel military industries. Manpower, in November 1947, the Haganah was an underground paramilitary force that had existed as a highly organized, national force, since the Arab riots of 1920 Euro 21, and throughout the riots of 1929, Great Uprising of 1936 Euro 39, and World War II. It had a mobile force, the HISH, which had 2,000 full-time fighters and 10,000 reservists and an elite unit, the Panch composed of 2,100 fighters and 1,000 reservists. The reservists trained three or four days a month and went back to civilian life the rest of the time. These mobile forces could rely on a garrison force, the HIM, composed of people aged over 25. The Ayishiv's total strength was around 35,000 with 15,000 to 18,000 fighters and a garrison force of roughly 20,000. Ergun, the Ergun, whose activities were considered by MI5 to be terrorism, was monitored by the British. There were also several thousand men and women who had served in the British Army in World War II who did not serve in any of the underground militias but would provide valuable military experience during the war. Walid Kaldi says the Ayishif had the additional forces of the Jewish Settlement Police, numbering some 12,000, the Gadna Youth Battalions, and the armed settlers. Few of the units had been trained by December 1947. On December 5, 1947, conscription was instituted for all men and women aged between 17 and 25 and by the end of March, 21,000 had been conscripted. On March 30, the call-up was extended to men and single women aged between 26 to 35. Five days later, a general mobilization order was issued for all men under 40. By March 1948, the Ayishif had a numerical superiority, with 35,780 mobilized and deployed troops for the Haganah, 3,000 of Stern and Ergun, and a few thousand armed settlers. Arab forces, according to Benny Morris, by the end of 1947, the Palestinians had a healthy and demoralizing respect for the Ayishiv's military power, 
and if it came to battle the Palestinians expected to lose. By March 1948, the effective number of Arab combatants numbered 12,000. The Ayishev had a numerical superiority. Political objectives, Ayishev, Ayishev's aims evolved during the war. Mobilization for a total war was organized. Initially, the aim was simple and modest to survive the assaults of the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab states. The Zionist leaders deeply, genuinely, feared a Middle Eastern reenactment of the Holocaust, which had just ended. The Arabs' public rhetoric reinforced these fears. As the war progressed, the aim of expanding the Jewish state beyond the UN partitioned borders appeared, first to incorporate clusters of isolated Jewish settlements and later to add more territories to the state and give it defensible borders. A third and further aim that emerged among the political and military leaders after four or five months was to reduce the size of Israel's prospective large and hostile Arab minority, seen as a potential powerful fifth column, by belligerency and expulsion. Planned Elit, or Plan D, was a plan worked out by the Haganah, a Jewish paramilitary group and the forerunner of the Israel Defense Forces, in autumn 1947 to spring 1948, which was sent to Haganah units in early March 1948. According to the academic Alan Pap, its purpose was to conquer as much of Palestine and to expel as many Palestinians as possible, though according to Benny Morris there was no such intent. In his book The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, Papa Copyright asserts that Planned Elit was a blueprint for ethnic cleansing with the aim of reducing both rural and urban areas of Palestine. According to Jelba, the plan specified that in case of resistance, the population of conquered villages was to be expelled outside the borders of the Jewish state. If no resistance was met, the residents could stay put, under military rule. According to Morris, Plan D called for occupying the areas within the UN-sponsored Jewish state, several concentrations of Jewish population outside those areas, and areas along the roads where the invading Arab armies were expected to attack. The intent of planned Elit is subject to much controversy, with historians on the one extreme asserting that it was entirely defensive, and historians on the other extreme asserting that the plan aimed at maximum conquest and expulsion of the Palestinians. The Ayishif perceived the peril of an Arab invasion as threatening its very existence. Having no real knowledge of the Arabs' true military capabilities, the Jews took Arab propaganda literally, preparing for the worst and reacting accordingly. The Arab League as a whole, the Arab League had unanimously rejected the UN partition plan and were bitterly opposed to the establishment of a Jewish state. The Arab League before partition affirmed the right to the independence of Palestine, while blocking the creation of a Palestinian government. Towards the end of 1947, the League established a military committee commanded by the retired Iraqi general Ismail Safwat, whose mission was to analyze the chance of victory of the Palestinians against the Jews. His conclusions were that they had no chance of victory and that an invasion of the Arab regular armies was mandatory. The political committee nevertheless rejected these conclusions and decided to support an armed opposition to the partition plan excluding the participation of their regular armed forces. In April with the Palestinian defeat, the refugees coming from Palestine and the pressure of their public opinion, the Arab leaders decided to invade Palestine. The Arab League gave reasons for its invasion in Palestine in the cablegram, the Arab states find themselves compelled to intervene in order to restore law and order and to check further bloodshed, the mandate over Palestine has come to an end, leaving no legally constituted authority, the only solution of the Palestine problem is the establishment of a unitary Palestinian state. A week before the armies marched, as Sam Pasha said, a Euro OE it does not matter how many, Jews there are we will sweep them into the sea. Some unofficial statements before the war had been more aggressive. Secretary Azam Pasha, according to an interview in an October 11, 1947 article of AKHBAR Ayom, said, I personally wish that the Jews do not drive us to this war, as this will be a war of extermination and a momentous massacre which will be spoken of like the Mongolian massacres and the Crusades. According to Yov Jelba, the Arab countries were drawn into the war by the collapse of the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab Liberation Army, 
and the Arab government's primary goal was preventing the Palestinian Arabs' total ruin and the flooding of their own countries by more refugees. According to their own perception, had the invasion not taken place, there was no Arab force in Palestine capable of checking the Haganah's offensive. Anyway, the Ayishif perceived the peril of an Arab invasion as threatening its very existence. Having no real knowledge of the Arabs' true military capabilities, the Jews took Arab propaganda literally, preparing for the worst and reacting accordingly. King Abdullah I of Jordan, King Abdullah was the commander of the Arab Legion, the strongest Arab army involved in the war. However, the Egyptian army was the most powerful and threatening army. The Arab Legion had about 10,000 soldiers, trained and commanded by British officers. In 1946 Euro 47, Abdullah said that he had no intention to resist or impede the partition of Palestine and creation of a Jewish state. Ideally, Abdullah would have liked to annex all of Palestine, but he was prepared to compromise. He supported the partition, intending that the West Bank area of the British mandate allocated for the Arab state be annexed to Jordan. Abdullah has secret meetings with a Jewish agency that reached an agreement of Jewish non-interference with Jordanian annexation of the West Bank and of Jordanian agreement not to attack the area of the Jewish state contained in the United Nations Partition Resolution. In order to keep their support to his plan of annexion of the Arab state, Abdullah promised to the British he would not attack the Jewish state. The neighboring Arab states pressured Abdullah into joining them in an all-Arab military invasion against the newly created State of Israel, that he used to restore his prestige in the Arab world, which had grown suspicious of his relatively good relationship with Western and Jewish leaders. Jordan's undertakings not to cross partition lines were not taken at face value. While repeating assurances that Jordan would only take areas allocated to a future Arab state, on the eve of war Tufik Abu al-Huda told the British that were other Arab armies to advance against Israel, Jordan would follow suit. On May 23 Abdullah told the French consul in Amman that he was determined to fight Zionism and prevent the establishment of an Israeli state on the border of his kingdom. Abdullah's role in this war became substantial. He saw himself as the supreme commander of the Arab forces, and persuaded the Arab League to appoint him to this position. Through his leadership, the Arabs fought the 1948 war to meet Abdullah's political goals. The other Arab states, King Farouk of Egypt was anxious to prevent Abdullah from being seen as the main champion of the Arab world in Palestine, which he feared might damage his own leadership aspirations of the Arab world. In addition, Farouk wished to annex all of southern Palestine to Egypt. According to Gamal Abdel Nasser the Egyptian army first communique described the Palestine operations as a merely punitive expedition against the Zionist gangs, using a term frequent in Haganah reports of Palestinian fighters. Nureyes said, the strong man of Iraq, had ambitions for bringing the entire Fertile Crescent under Iraqi leadership. Both Syria and Lebanon wished to take certain areas of northern Palestine. One result of the ambitions of the various Arab leaders was a distrust of all the Palestinian leaders who wished to set up a Palestinian state, and a mutual distrust of each other. Cooperation was to be very poor during the war between the various Palestinian factions and the Arab armies. Arab Higher Committee of Amin al Husseini. Following rumors that King Abdullah was reopening the bilateral negotiations with Israel that he had previously conducted in secret with the Jewish Agency, the Arab League, led by Egypt, decided to set up the all-Palestine government in Gaza on September 8 under the nominal leadership of the Mufti. Abdullah regarded the attempt to revive al husseinis Holy War Army as a challenge to his authority and all armed bodies operating in the areas controlled by the Arab Legion were disbanded. Glub Pasha carried out the order ruthlessly and efficiently. Initial lineup of forces, military assessments, on the eve of war the Palestinians hardly existed as a military force. The British intelligence and Arab League military reached similar conclusions. The British Foreign Ministry and CIA believed that the Arab states would finally win in case of war. Martin Van Creveld says that in terms of manpower, the sides were fairly evenly matched. In May the Egyptians generals told their government that the invasion will be a Euro OEA parade without any RISKSA Euro and Tel Aviv a Euro OE in two weeks a Euro. Egypt, Iraq, 
and Syria all possessed air forces, Egypt and Syria had tanks, and all had some modern artillery. Initially, the Haganah had no heavy machine guns, artillery, armored vehicles, anti-tank or anti-aircraft weapons, nor military aircraft or tanks. The four Arab armies that invaded on May 15 were far stronger than the Haganah formations they initially encountered. On May 12, three days before the invasion, David Ben-Gurion was told by his chief military advisers that Israel's chances of winning a war against the Arab states were only about even. Ayish of Israeli forces, Jewish forces at the invasion, sources disagree about the amount of arms at the Ayishiv's disposal at the end of the mandate. According to Kash before the arrival of arms shipments from Czechoslovakia as part of Operation Balak, there was roughly one weapon for every three fighters, and even the Palmch could arm only two out of every three of its active members. According to Collins and LaPierre, by April 1948, the Haganah had managed to accumulate only about 20,000 rifles and Sten guns for the 35,000 soldiers who existed on paper. According to Walid Khaldi the arms at the disposal of these forces were plentiful. France authorized Air France to transport cargo to Tel Aviv on May 13. Ayishiv forces were organized in nine brigades, and their numbers grew following Israeli independence, eventually expanding to 12 brigades. Although both sides increased their manpower over the first few months of the war, the Israeli forces grew steadily as a result of the progressive mobilization of Israeli society and the influx of an average of 10,300 immigrants each month. By the end of 1948, the Israel Defense Forces had 88,033 soldiers, including 60,000 combat soldiers. After the invasion, France allowed aircraft carrying arms from Czechoslovakia to land on French territory in transit to Israel, and permitted two arms shipments to a Euro Nicaragua or Euro unregistered trademark, which were actually intended for Israel. Czechoslovakia supplied vast quantities of arms to Israel during the war, including thousands of VZ. 24 rifles and MG-34 and ZB-37 machine guns, and millions of rounds of ammunition. Czechoslovakia supplied fighter aircraft, including at first her Navy S-199 fighter planes. The Haganah readied 12 cargo ships throughout European ports to transfer the accumulated equipment, which would set sail as soon as the British blockade was lifted with the expiration of the mandate. Following Israeli independence, the Israelis managed to build three Sherman tanks from scrap heap material found in abandoned British ordnance depots. The Haganah also managed to obtain stocks of British weapons due to the logistical complexity of the British withdrawal, and the corruption of a number of officials. After the first truce, by July 1948, the Israelis had established an air force, a navy, and a tank battalion. On June 29, 1948, the day before the last British troops left Haifa, two British soldiers sympathetic to the Israelis stole two Cromwell tanks from an arms depot in the Haifa port area, smashing them through the unguarded gates, and joined the IDF with the tanks. These two tanks would form the basis of the Israeli Armored Corps. After the second truce, Czechoslovakia supplied supermarine Spitfire fighter planes, which was smuggled to Israel via an abandoned Luftwaffe runway in Yugoslavia, with the agreement of the Yugoslav government. The airborne arms smuggling missions from Czechoslovakia were codenamed Operation Balak. Arab forces, at the invasion, in addition to the local irregular Palestinians militia groups. The five Arab states that joined the war were Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon and Iraq sending expeditionary forces of their regular armies. Additional contingents came from Saudi Arabia and Yemen. On the eve of the war, the available number of Arab troops likely to be committed to war was between 23,000-20,000, in addition to the irregular Palestinians already present. Prior to the war, Arab forces had been trained by British and French instructors. This was particularly true of Jordan's Arab Legion under command of Lieutenant General Sir John Glob. Syria bought from Czechoslovakia a quantity of small arms for the Arab Liberation Army but the shipment never arrived due to Haganah force intervention. Arab states, Jordan's Arab Legion was considered the most effective Arab force. Armed, trained and commanded by British officers, 
This 8,000 Euro 12,000 strong force was organized in four infantry mechanized regiments supported by some 40 artillery pieces and 75 armored cars. Until January 1948, it was reinforced by the 3,000 strong Transjordan Frontier Force. As many as 48 British officers served in the Arab Legion. Glub Pasha, the commander of the Legion, organized his forces into four brigades as follows. The Arab Legion joined the war in May 1948, but fought only in the areas that King Abdullah wanted to secure for Jordan, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. France prevented a large sale of arms by a Swiss company to Ethiopia, brokered by the UK Foreign Office, which was actually destined for Egypt and Jordan, and denied a British request at the end of April to permit the landing of a squadron of British aircraft on their way to Transjordan. The Jordanian forces were probably the best trained of all combatants. Other combatant forces lacked the ability to make strategic decisions and tactical maneuvers, as evidenced by positioning the 4th Regiment at Latron, which was abandoned by ALA combatants before the arrival of the Jordanian forces and the importance of which was not fully understood by the Haganah general staff. In the later stages of the war, Latron proved to be of extreme importance and a decisive factor for Jerusalem's fate. Iraq's army in 1948, had an of 21,000 men in 12 brigades and the Iraqi Air Force had 100 planes, mostly British. Initially the Iraqis committed around 3,000 men to the war effort, including four infantry brigades, one armored battalion and support personnel. These forces were to operate under Jordanian guidance. The first Iraqi forces to be deployed reached Jordan in April 1948 under the command of General Nur ad Din Mahmud. Egypt's army in 1948 was able to put a maximum of around 40,000 men into the field, 80% of its military age male population being unfit for military service and its embryonic logistics system being limited in its ability to support ground forces deployed beyond its borders. Initially, an expeditionary force of 10,000 men was sent to Palestine under the command of Major General Ahmed Ali al -Mui. This force consisted of five infantry battalions, one armoured battalion equipped with British light tank Mk-6 and Matilda tanks, one battalion of 16 25-pounder guns, a battalion of eight 6-pounder guns and one medium machine gun battalion with supporting troops. France prevented a large sale of arms by a Swiss company to Ethiopia, brokered by the UK Foreign Office, which was actually destined for Egypt and Jordan, and applied diplomatic pressure on Belgium to suspend arms sales to the Arab states. The Egyptian Air Force had over 30 Spitfires, four Hawker Hurricanes and 20 C-47S modified into crude bombers. Syria had 12,000 soldiers at the beginning of the 1948 war grouped into three infantry brigades and an armoured force of approximately battalion size. The Syrian Air Force had 50 planes, the ten newest of which were World War A Euro generation models. France suspended arms sales to Syria, notwithstanding signed contracts. Lebanon's army was the smallest of the Arab armies, consisting of only 3,500 soldiers. According to Jelba, in June 1947, Ben Gurion arrived at an agreement with the Maronite religious leadership in Lebanon that cost a few thousand pounds and kept Lebanon's army out of the War of Independence and the military Arab coalition. According to Rogan and Schlem, a token force of 1,000 was committed to the invasion. It crossed in the northern Galilee and was repulsed by Israeli forces. Israel then invaded and occupied southern Lebanon until the end of the war. Arab forces after the first truce, by the time of the second truce, the Egyptians had 20,000 men in the field in 13 battalions equipped with 135 tanks and 90 artillery pieces. During the first truce, the Iraqis increased their force to about 10,000. Ultimately, the Iraqi expeditionary force numbered around 18,000 men. Saudi Arabia sent hundreds of volunteers to join the Arab forces. In February 1948, Around 800 tribesmen had gathered near Aqaba so as to invade the Negev, but crossed to Egypt after Saudi rival King Abdullah officially denied them permission to pass through Jordanian territory. The Saudi troops were attached to the Egyptian command throughout the war, and estimates of their total strength ranged up to 1,200. By July 1948, 
the Saudis comprised three brigades within the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, and were stationed as guards between Gaza City and Rafah. This area came under heavy aerial bombardment during Operation Yov in October, and faced a land assault beginning in late December which culminated in the Battle of Rafah in early January of the new year. With the subsequent armistice of February 24, 1949 and evacuation of almost 4,000 Arab soldiers and civilians from Gaza, the Saudi contingent withdrew through Erish and returned to Saudi Arabia. During the first truce, Sudan sent six companies of regular troops to fight alongside the Egyptians. Yemen also committed a small expeditionary force to the war effort, and contingents from Morocco joined the Arab armies as well. Course of the war, at the last moment, several Arab leaders, to avert catastrophe a Euro secretly appealed to the British to hold on in Palestine for at least another year. First phase, May 15 for Euro June 11, 1948. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel, a few hours before the termination of the mandate at midnight. On May 15, 1948, Iraq and the neighboring Arab states, Egypt, Jordan and Syria, invaded what had just ceased to be the territory of the British Mandate, and immediately attacked Jewish settlements. What was now Israel had already, from April 1 down to May 14, conducted eight of its thirteen full-scale military operations outside of the area allotted to a Jewish state by partition and the operational commander Yigal Allen later stated that had it not been for the Arab invasion, Haganah's forces would have reached the natural borders of western Israel. Although the Arab invasion was denounced by the United States, the Soviet Union, and UN Secretary General Tridge Bly, it found support from Taiwan and other UN member states. The initial Arab plans called for Syrian and Lebanese forces to invade from north while Jordanian and Iraqi forces were to invade from east in order to meet at Nazareth and then to push forward together to Haifa. In the south, the Egyptians were to advance and take Tel Aviv. At the Arab League meeting in Damascus on 11 Euro May 13, Abdullah rejected the plan, which served Syrian interest, using the fact his allies were afraid to go to war without his army. He proposed that the Iraqis attack the Jezreel Valley and Arab Legion enter Ramallah and Nablus and link with the Egyptian army at Hebron, which was more in compliance with his political objective to occupy the territory allocated to the Arab state by the partition plan and promises not to invade the territory allocated to the Jewish state by the partition plan. In addition, Lebanon decided not to take part in the war at the last minute due to the still influential Christians' opposition and to Jewish bribes. Intelligence provided by the French consulate in Jerusalem on May 12, 1948 on the Arab army's invading forces and their revised plan to invade the new state contributed to Israeli Euro unregistered trademark S success in withstanding the Arab invasion. The first mission of the Jewish forces was to hold on against the Arab armies and stop them, although the Arabs had enjoyed major advantages. As the British stopped blocking the incoming Jewish immigrants and arms supply, the Israeli forces grew steadily with large numbers of immigrants and weapons, that allowed the Haganah to transform itself from a paramilitary force into a real army. Initially, the fighting was handled mainly by the Haganah, along with the smaller Jewish militant group Sergum and Lai. On May 26, 1948, Israel established the Israel Defense Forces, incorporating these forces into one military under a central command. Southern Front, Negev the Egyptian force, the largest among the Arab armies, invaded from the south. On May 15, 1948, the Egyptians attacked two settlements, Nairim, using artillery, armored cars carrying cannons, and Bren carriers, and Kfa Adaram using artillery, tanks and aircraft. The Egyptians' attacks met fierce resistance from the only few and lightly armed defenders of both settlements, and failed. On May 19 the Egyptians attacked Yad Mordecai, where an inferior force of 100 Israelis armed with nothing more than rifles, a medium machine gun and a PI-80 anti-tank weapon, held up a column of 2,500 Egyptians, well supported by armor, artillery and air units, for five days. The Egyptians took heavy losses, while the losses sustained by the defenders were comparatively light. 
one of the Egyptian force two main columns made its way northwards along the shoreline, through what is today the Gaza Strip and the other column advanced eastwards toward Beersheba. To secure their flanks, the Egyptians attacked and laid siege to a number of kibbutzim in the Negev, among those Kfa Adaram, Nairim, Yad Mordecai, and Negba. The Israeli defenders held out fiercely for days against vastly superior forces, and managed to buy valuable time for the IDF's Javati Brigade to prepare to stop the Egyptian drive on Tel Aviv. On May 28 the Egyptians renewed their northern advance, and stopped at a destroyed bridge north to Asdud. The Javati Brigade reported this advance but no troops were sent to confront the Egyptians. Had the Egyptians wished to continue their advance northward, towards Tel Aviv, there was no Israeli force to block them. From May 29 to June 3, Israeli forces stopped the Egyptian drive north in Operation Pleshit. In the first combat mission performed by Israel's fledgling air force, four Avia S-199s attacked an Egyptian armored column of 500 vehicles on its way to Hasdud. The Israeli planes dropped 70-kilogram bombs and strafed the column, although their machine guns jammed quickly. Two of the planes crashed, killing a pilot. The attack caused the Egyptians to scatter, and they had lost the initiative by the time they had regrouped. Following the air attack, Israeli forces constantly bombarded Egyptian forces in Isdot with Napoleonic cannons, and IDF patrols engaged in small-scale harassment of Egyptian lines. Following another air attack, the Javati Brigade launched a counterattack. Although the counterattack was repulsed, the Egyptian offensive was halted as Egypt changed its strategy from offensive to defensive, and the initiative shifted to Israel. On June 6, in the Battle of Nitzanim, Egyptian forces attacked the kibbutz of Nitzanim, located between Mordel and Izdad, and the Israeli defenders surrendered after resisting for five days. Battles of Litron The heaviest fighting occurred in Jerusalem and on the Jerusalem a Euro Tel Aviv road, between Jordan's Arab Legion and Israeli forces. As part of the redeployment to deal with the Egyptian advance, the Israelis abandoned the Latron fortress overlooking the main highway to Jerusalem, which the Arab Legion immediately seized. The Arab Legion also occupied the Latron monastery. From these positions, the Jordanians were able to cut off supplies to Israeli troops and civilians in Jerusalem. The Israelis attempted to take the Latron fortress in a series of battles lasting from May 24 to July 18. The Arab Legion held Latron and managed to repulse the attacks. During the attempts to take Latron, Israeli forces suffered some 586 casualties, among them Mickey Marcus, Israel's first general, who was killed by friendly fire. The Arab Legion also took significant losses, losing 90 dead and some 200 wounded up to May 29. The besieged Israeli Jerusalem was only saved via the opening of the so-called Burma Road, a makeshift bypass road built by Israeli forces that allowed Israeli supply convoys to pass into Jerusalem. Parts of the area where the road was built were cleared of Jordanian snipers in May and the road was completed on June 14. Supplies had already begun passing through before the road was completed with the first convoy passing through on the night of 1 a Euro June 2nd. The Jordanians spotted the activity and attempted to shell the road, but were ineffective, as it could not be seen. However, Jordanian sharpshooters killed several road workers, and an attack on June 9 left eight Israelis dead. On July 18, elements of the Harold Brigade took about ten villages to the south of Litron to enlarge and secure the area of the Burma Road. The Arab Legion was able to repel an Israeli attack on Latron. The Jordanians launched two counterattacks, temporarily taking Beit Susan before being forced back, and capturing Jezer after a fierce battle. Battle for Jerusalem The Jordanians and Latron cut off supplies to western Jerusalem. Though some supplies, mostly munitions, were air-dropped into the city, the shortage of food, water, fuel and medicine was acute. The Israeli forces were seriously short of food, water and ammunition. King Abdullah ordered Gad Pasha, the commander of the Arab Legion, to enter Jerusalem on May 17. The Arab Legion fired 10,000 artillery and mortar shells a day, and also attacked West Jerusalem with sniper fire. 
heavy house-to-house -house fighting occurred between 19 and 28 May, with the Arab Legion eventually succeeding in pushing Israeli forces from the Arab neighborhoods of Jerusalem as well as the Jewish quarter of the Old City. The 1,500 Jewish inhabitants of the Old City's Jewish quarter were expelled, and several hundred were detained. The Jews had to be escorted out by the Arab Legion to protect them against Palestinian Arab mobs that intended to massacre them. On May 22, Arab forces attacked Kibbutz Ramat Rachel south of Jerusalem. After a fierce battle in which 31 Jordanians and 13 Israelis were killed, the defenders of Ramat Rachel withdrew, only to partially retake the kibbutz the following day. Fighting continued until May 26, until the entire kibbutz was recaptured. Radar Hill was also taken from the Arab Legion, and held until May 26, when the Jordanians retook it in a battle that left 19 Israelis and two Jordanians dead. A total of 23 attempts by the Harold Brigade to capture Radar Hill in the war failed. The same day, Thomas C. Wasson, the U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem and a member of the UN Truce Commission was shot dead in West Jerusalem. It was disputed whether Wasson was killed by the Arabs or Israelis. Northern Samaria An Iraqi force consisting of two infantry and one armored brigade crossed the Jordan River from northern Jordan, attacking the Israeli settlement of Geshur with little success. Following this defeat, Iraqi forces moved into the strategic triangle bounded by the Arab towns Nablus, Jenin and Tulkarm. On May 25, they were making their way towards Netanya, when they were stopped. On May 29, an Israeli attack against the Iraqis led to three days of heavy fighting over Jenin, but Iraqi forces managed to hold their positions. After these battles, the Iraqi forces became stationary and their involvement in the war effectively ended. Iraqi forces failed in their attacks on Israeli settlements with the most notable battle taking place at Gesha, and instead took defensive positions around Jenin, Nablus, and Tel Qam, from where they could put pressure on the Israeli center. On May 25, Iraqi forces advanced from Tal Qam, taking Jilim and reaching Kfar Yona and Ian veered on the Tal Qam Netanya Road. The Alexandroni Brigade then stopped the Iraqi advance and retook Jilim. On June 1, the Karmali and Galani brigades captured Jenin from Iraqi forces. They were pushed out by an Iraqi counterattack and lost 34 dead and 100 wounded. Northern Front, Lake of Galilee. On May 14, Syria invaded Palestine with the 1st Infantry Brigade supported by a battalion of armored cars, a company of French I 35 and a 37 tanks, an artillery battalion, and other units. The Syrian president, Shikri al Khawatli instructed his troops in the front, a Euro Oeto destroy the Zionists. A Euro Oe, the situation was very grave. There are really Euro unregistered trademark T enough rifles. There are no heavy weapons, a Euro Ben Gurion told the Israeli cabinet. On May 15, the Syrian forces turned to the eastern and southern Sea of Galilee shores and attacked Samak, the neighboring Tegart fort, and the settlements of Sher Hargolan, Ian Geth but were bogged down by resistance. Later, they attacked Samak using tanks and air force, and on May 18 succeeded to conquer Samak, and to occupy the abandoned Sher Hargolon. On May 21, the Syrian army was stopped at Kibbutz de Ghania Ilf in the north, where local militia reinforced by elements of the Karmali Brigade halted Syrian armored forces with Molotov cocktails, hand grenades and a single PIAT. One tank that was disabled by Molotov cocktails and hand grenades still remains at the kibbutz. The remaining Syrian forces were driven off the next day with four Napoleonic mountain guns a Euro Israel's first use of artillery during the war. Following the Syrian forces' defeat at the Deganias a few days later, they abandoned Samak village. The Syrians were forced to besiege the kibbutz rather than advance. The main reason for the Syrian defeat was their low esteem of the Jewish ability to face the Arab armies. On June 6, nearly two brigades of the Arab Liberation Army and the Lebanese Army took Malkia and Kadesh. That was the only intervention of the Lebanese Army in that war. On June 6, Syrian forces attacked Mishma Hayyadan, but were repulsed. On June 10, the Syrians overran Mishma Hayyadan and advanced to the main road where they were stopped by units of the Odid Brigade. 
Subsequently, the Syrians reverted to a defensive posture, conducting only a few minor attacks on small, exposed Israeli settlements. Palestinian forces In the continuity of the civil war between Jewish and Arab forces that had begun in 1947, battles between Israeli forces and Palestinian Arab militias took place, particularly in the Lida, Al Ramla, Jerusalem, and Haifa areas. On May 23, the Alexandroni Brigade captured Tanchura, south of Haifa, from Arab forces. On June 2, Holy War Army Commander Hossam Salama was killed in a battle with Haganah at Ras Ali in Air Operations All Jewish aviation assets were placed under the control of the Shrut of Ir in November 1947 and flying operations began in the following month from a small civil airport on the outskirts of Tel Aviv called Sde Dov with the first ground support operation taking place on December 17. The Galilee Squadron was formed at Yevnel in March 1948, and the Negev Squadron was formed at Nurim in April. By May 10, when the SA suffered its first combat loss, there were three flying units, an air staff, maintenance facilities and logistics support. At the outbreak of the war on May 15, the SA became the Israeli Air Force. With its fleet of light planes it was no match for Arab forces during the first few weeks of the war with their T-6s, Spitfires, C-47s, and Abroansons. On May 15, with the beginning of the war, four Royal Egyptian Air Force Spitfires attacked Tel Aviv, bombing SDE Dov airfield, where the bulk of Shrut Avir's aircraft were concentrated, as well as the Reading Power Station. Several aircraft were destroyed, some others were damaged, and five Israelis were killed. Throughout the following hours, additional waves of Egyptian aircraft bombed and strafed targets around Tel Aviv, although these raids had little effect. One Spitfire was shot down by anti-aircraft fire, and its pilot was taken prisoner. Throughout the next six days, the RAAF would continue to attack Tel Aviv, causing civilian casualties. On May 18, Egyptian warplanes attacked the Tel Aviv Central Bus Station, killing 42 people and wounding 100. In addition to their attacks on Tel Aviv, the Egyptians also bombed rural settlements and airfields, though few casualties were caused in these raids. At the outset of the war, the RAAF was able to attack Israel with near impunity, due to the lack of Israeli fighter aircraft to intercept them, and met only ground fire. As more effective air defenses were transferred to Tel Aviv, the Egyptians began taking significant aircraft losses. As a result of these losses, as well as the loss of five Spitfires downed by the British when the Egyptians mistakenly attacked RAF Ramat David, the Egyptian air attacks became less frequent. By the end of May 1948, almost the entire RAF Spitfire squadron based in El Arish had been lost, including many of its best pilots. Although lacking fighter or bomber aircraft, in the first few days of the war, Israel's embryonic air force still attacked Arab targets, with light aircraft being utilized as makeshift bombers, striking Arab encampments and columns. The raids were mostly carried out at night to avoid interception by Arab fighter aircraft. These attacks usually had little effect, except on morale. The balance of air power soon began to swing in favor of the Israeli Air Force following the arrival of 25 Avia S 199s from Czechoslovakia, the first of which arrived in Israel on May 20. Ironically, Israel was using the Avia S 199, an inferior derivative of the Bf 109 designed in Nazi Germany to counter British designed Spitfires flown by Egypt. Throughout the rest of the war, Israel would acquire more Avia fighters as well as 62 Spitfires from Czechoslovakia. On May 28, 1948, Shrut Abir became the Israeli Air Force. Many of the pilots who fought for the Israeli Air Force were foreign volunteers or mercenaries, including many World War II veterans. On June 3, Israel scored its first victory in aerial combat when Israeli pilot Modi Alan shot down a pair of Egyptian DC-3s that had just bombed Tel Aviv. Although Tel Aviv would see additional raids by fighter aircraft, there would be no more raids by bombers for the rest of the war. From then on, the Israeli Air Force began engaging the Arab Air Forces in air-to-air -air combat. The first dogfight took place on June 8, 
when an Israeli fighter plane flown by Gideon Lichtman shot down an Egyptian Spitfire. By the fall of 1948, the IAF had achieved air superiority and had superior firepower and more knowledgeable personnel, many of whom had seen action in World War II. Israeli planes then began intercepting and engaging Arab aircraft on bombing missions. Following Israeli air attacks on Egyptian and Iraqi columns, the Egyptians repeatedly bombed Ekron airfield, where IAF fighters were based. During a May 30 raid, bombs aimed for Ekron hit central Riyabot, killing seven civilians and wounding 30. In response to this, and probably to the Jordanian victories at Latran, Israel began bombing targets in Arab cities. On the night of May 1, 31 June, the first Israeli raid on an Arab capital took place when three IAF planes flew to Amman and dropped several dozen 55- and 110-pound bombs, hitting the King's Palace and an adjacent British airfield. Some 12 people were killed and 30 wounded. During the attack, an RAF hangar was damaged, as were some British aircraft. The British threatened that in the event of another such attack, they would shoot down the attacking aircraft and bomb Israeli airfields, and as a result, Israeli aircraft did not attack Amman again for the rest of the war. Israel also bombed Arish, Gaza, Damascus, and Cairo. Israeli B-17 bombers coming to Israel from Czechoslovakia bombed Egypt on their way to Israel. According to Alan Dershowitz, Israeli planes focused on bombing military targets in these attacks though Benny Morris wrote that on June 11 their raid on Damascus was indiscriminate. Sea battles, at the outset of the war, the Israeli navy consisted of three former Aliabet ships that had been seized by the British and impounded in Haifa Harbor, where they were tied up at the breakwater. Work on establishing a navy had begun shortly before Israeli independence, and the three ships were selected due to them having a military background. One, the INS Elat was an ex-U.S. Coast Guard icebreaker, and the other two, the INS Huguenot and INS Wedgwood, had been Royal Canadian Navy corvettes. The ships were put into minimum running condition by contractors dressed as stevedores and port personnel, who were able to work in the engine rooms and below deck. The work had to be clandestine to avoid arousing British suspicion. On May 21, 1948, the three ships set sail for Tel Aviv and were made to look like ships that had been purchased by foreign owners for commercial use. In Tel Aviv, the ships were fitted with small field guns dating to the late 19th century and anti-aircraft guns. After the British left Haifa port on June 30, Haifa became the main base of the Israeli Navy. In October 1948, a submarine chaser was purchased from the United States. The warships were manned by former merchant seamen, former crew members of Alia ships, Israelis who had served in the Royal Navy during World War II, and foreign volunteers. The newly refurbished and crewed warships served on coastal patrol duties and bombarded Egyptian coastal installations in and around the Gaza area all the way to Port Said. And of the first phase, throughout the following days, the Arabs were only able to make limited gains due to fierce Israeli resistance and were quickly driven off their new holdings by Israeli counterattacks. As the war progressed, the IDF managed to field more troops than the Arab forces. In July 1948, the IDF had 63,000 troops. By early spring 1949, they had 115,000. The Arab armies had an estimated 40,000 troops in July 1948, rising to 55,000 in October 1948, and slightly more by the spring of 1949. First truce, June 11 the Euro July 8, 1948, the Union declared a truce on May 29, which came into effect on June 11 and lasted 28 days. The truce was designed to last 28 days and an arms embargo was declared with the intention that neither side would make any gains from the truce. Neither side respected the truce. Both found ways around the restrictions placed on them. Both the Israelis and the Arabs used this time to improve their positions, a direct violation of the terms of the ceasefire. Enforcements, at the time of the truce, the British view was that the Jews are too weak in armament to achieve spectacular success. As the truce commenced, 
a British officer stationed in Haifa stated that the four-week-long truce would certainly be exploited by the Jews to continue military training and reorganization while the Arabs would waste, them feuding over the future divisions of the spoils. During the truce, the Israelis sought to bolster their forces by massive import of arms. The IDF was able to acquire weapons from Czechoslovakia as well as improve training of forces and reorganization of the army during this time. Yitzhak Rabin, an IDF commander at the time of the war and later Israel's fifth prime minister, stated, W. Ithart the arms from Czechoslovakia. It is very doubtful whether we would have been able to conduct the war. The Israeli army increased its manpower from approximately 30,000 a Euro 35,000 men to almost 65,000 during the truce due to mobilization and the constant immigration into Israel. It was also able to increase its arms supply to more than 25,000 rifles, 5,000 machine guns, and 50 million bullets. As well as violating the arms and personal embargo, they also sent fresh units to the front lines like the Arabs. During the truce, Ergun attempted to bring in a private arms shipment aboard a ship called Altalna. When they refused to hand the arms to the Israeli government, Ben Gurion ordered that the ship be sunk. Several Ergun members were killed in the fighting. UN mediator Bernadotte. The ceasefire was overseen by UN mediator folk Bernadotte and a team of UN observers made up of army officers from Belgium, United States, Sweden, and France. Bernadotte was voted in by the General Assembly to assure the safety of the holy places, to safeguard the well-being of the population, and to promote a peaceful adjustment of the future situation of Palestine. Folk Bernadotte reported. During the period of the truce, three violations occurred. Of such a serious nature, the attempt by the Ergums via Lumi to bring war materials and immigrants, including men of military age into Palestine aboard the ship a Euro OE Altlena Euro on June 21. Another truce violation occurred through the refusal of Egyptian forces to permit the passage of relief convoys to Jewish settlements in the Negb. The third violation of the truce arose as a result of the failure of the Transjordan and Iraqi forces to permit the flow of water to Jerusalem. After the truce was in place, Bernadotte began to address the issue of achieving a political settlement. The main obstacles in his opinion were the Arab world's continued rejection of the existence of a Jewish state, whatever its borders. Israel's new philosophy, based on its increasing military strength, of ignoring the partition boundaries and conquering what additional territory it could. And the emerging Palestinian Arab refugee problem. Taking all the issues into account, Bernadotte presented a new partition plan. He proposed there be a Palestinian Arab state alongside Israel and that a union be established between the two sovereign states of Israel and Jordan. That the Negev, or part of it, be included in the Arab state and that Western Galilee, or part of it, be included in Israel. That the whole of Jerusalem be part of the Arab state, with the Jewish areas enjoying municipal autonomy and that Lida Airport and Haifa be free ports a Euro presumably free of Israeli or Arab sovereignty. Israel rejected the proposal, in particular the aspect of losing control of Jerusalem, but they did agree to extend the truce for another month. The Arabs rejected both the extension of the truce and the proposal. Second phase, 8 Euro July 18, 1948, on July 8, the day before the expiration of the truce, Egyptian forces under General Mohammed Negub renewed the war by attacking Negba. The following day, Israeli forces launched a simultaneous offensive on all three fronts. The fighting continued for ten days until the UN Security Council issued the second truce on July 18. During the fighting, the Israelis were able to open a lifeline to a number of besieged kibbutzim. During those ten days, the fighting was dominated by large-scale Israeli offensives and a defensive posture from the Arab side. Southern Front In the south, the IDF carried out several offensives, including Operation Enfar and Operation Death to the Invader. The task of the 11th Brigade's 1st Battalion in the southern flank was to capture villages, and its operation ran smoothly, with but little resistance from local irregulars. According to Amnon Newman, a Panch veteran of the Southern Front, hardly any Arab villages in the south fought back, due to the miserable poverty of their means and lack of weapons, and suffered expulsion. 
What slight resistance was offered was quelled by an artillery barrage, followed by the storming of the village, whose residents were expelled and houses destroyed. On July 12, the Egyptians launched an offensive action, and again attacked Negba, which they had previously failed to capture, using three infantry battalions, an armored battalion, and an artillery regiment. In the battle that followed, the Egyptians were repulsed, suffering 200 a Euro 300 casualties, while the Israelis lost five dead and 16 wounded. After failing to take Negba, the Egyptians turned their attention to more isolated settlements and positions. On July 14, an Egyptian attack on Gaulon was driven off by a minefield and by resistance from Gaulon's residents. The Egyptians then assaulted the lightly defended village of Bar at Yitzhak. The Egyptians managed to penetrate the village perimeter, but the defenders concentrated in an inner position in the village and fought off the Egyptian advance until IDF reinforcements arrived and drove out the attackers. The Egyptians suffered an estimated 200 casualties, while the Israelis had 17 dead and 15 wounded. The battle was one of Egypt's last offensive actions during the war, and the Egyptians did not attack any Israeli villages following this battle. Lida and Al Ramla on July 10, Glaab Passion ordered the defending Arab Legion troops to make arrangements for a phony war. Israeli Operation Dani was the most important Israeli offensive, aimed at securing and enlarging the corridor between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv by capturing the roadside cities Lod and Ram. In a second plan stage of the operation the fortified positions of Litruna Euro overlooking the Tel Aviv-Jerusalem Highway are Euro and the city of Ramallah were also to be captured. Hadata, near Litran, was captured by the Israelis at a cost of nine dead. The objectives of Operation Dani were to capture territory east of Tel Aviv and then to push inland and relieve the Jewish population and forces in Jerusalem. Lida had become an important military center in the region, lending support to Arab military activities elsewhere, and Ramallah was one of the main obstacles blocking Jewish transportation. Lida was defended by a local militia of around 1,000 residents, with an Arab Legion contingent of 125 a Euro 300. The IDF forces gathered to attack the city numbered around 8,000. It was the first operation where several brigades were involved. The city was attacked from the north by a model al Sadiq and al Muzairi, and from the east by a Qadr, al Qabab, Jimzu, and Denial. Bombers were also used for the first time in the conflict to bombard the city. The IDF captured the city on July 11. Up to 450 Arabs and 9 a Euro 10 Israeli soldiers were killed. The next day, Ram fell. The civilian populations of Lida and Ram fled or were expelled to the Arab front lines, and following resistance in Lida, the population there was expelled without provision of transport vehicles. Some of the evictees died on the long walk under the hot July sun. On 15 a Euro July 16, an attack on Latrum took place but did not manage to occupy the fort. A desperate second attempt occurred on July 18 by units from the Yiftage Brigade equipped with armored vehicles, including two Cromwell tanks, but that attack also failed. Despite the second truce, which began on July 18, the Israeli efforts to conquer Latrum continued until July 20. Jerusalem Operation Gdamim was to secure the old city of Jerusalem, but fewer resources were allocated. The operation failed. Originally Operation Gdam was to begin on July 8, immediately after the first truce, by Ergun and Lerni forces. However, it was delayed by David Shaltiel possibly because he did not trust their ability after their failure to capture Du Yassin without Haganah assistance. Ergun forces commanded by Yehuda Lapidot were to break through at the new gate, Lerli was to break through the wall stretching from the new gate to the Jaffa gate, and the Beit Horon battalion was to strike from Mount Zion. The battle was planned to begin on the Sabbath, at 20 o'clock on July 16, two days before the second ceasefire of the war. The plan went wrong from the beginning and was postponed first to 23.00 and then to midnight. It was not until 02.30 that the battle actually began. The airgun managed to break through at the new gate, but the other forces failed in their missions. At 5.45 on July 17, Shaltiel ordered a retreat and to cease hostilities. 
On July 14, 1948, Ergun occupied the Arab village of Mala after a fierce battle. Several hours later, the Arabs launched a counterattack, but Israeli reinforcements arrived, and the village was retaken at a cost of 17 dead. Southern Galilee The second plan was Operation Decal, which was aimed at capturing the Lower Galilee including Nazareth. Nazareth was captured on July 16, and by the time the second truce took effect at 19 o'clock July 18, the whole Lower Galilee from Haifa Bay to the Sea of Galilee was captured by Israel. Eastern Galilee Operation Brosh was launched in a failed attempt to dislodge Syrian forces from the Eastern Galilee and the Banat Yaakov Bridge. During the operation, 200 Syrians and 100 Israelis were killed. The Israeli Air Force also bombed Damascus for the first time. Second Truce, July 18 – Euro October 15, 1948 At 19 o'clock on July 18, the second truce of the conflict went into effect after intense diplomatic efforts by the UN. On September 16, Count Folk Bernadotte proposed a new partition for Palestine in which the Negev would be divided between Jordan and Egypt, and Jordan would annex Lida and Ramla. There would be a Jewish state in the whole of Galilee, with the frontier running from Fallujah northeast towards Ramla and Lida. Jerusalem would be internationalized, with municipal autonomy for the city's Jewish and Arab inhabitants, the port of Haifa would be a free port, and Lida Airport would be a free airport. All Palestinian refugees would be granted the right of return, and those who chose not to return would be compensated for lost property. The Union would control and regulate Jewish immigration. The plan was once again rejected by both sides. On the next day, September 17, Bernadotte was assassinated in Jerusalem by the militant Zionist group Lai. A four-man team ambushed Bernadotte's motorcade in Jerusalem killing him and a French Union observer sitting next to him. Larry saw Bernadotte as a British and Arab puppet, and thus a serious threat to the emerging state of Israel, and feared that the provisional Israeli government would accept the plan, which it considered disastrous. Unbeknownst to Larry, the government had already decided to reject it and resume combat in a month. Bernadotte's deputy, American Ralph Bunch, replaced him. On September 22, 1948, the Provisional State Council of Israel passed the Area of Jurisdiction and Powers Ordinance, 5708-1948. The law officially added to Israel's size by annexing all land it had captured since the war began. It also declared that from then on, any part of Palestine captured by the Israeli army would automatically become part of Israel. Little Triangle Pocket Operation Shotter was launched a week after the truce came into effect against an area known as the Little Triangle south of Haifa, with the aim of taking the final Arab pocket on the Tel Aviv-Haifa road. The Arabs had blocked the road to Israeli traffic along the highway, and poorly planned assaults on June 18 and July 8 had failed to dislodge Arab militia from their superior positions. The operation was launched on July 24, in response to the killings of two Israeli civilians. Israeli assaults on 24 and 25 July were beaten back by stiff resistance. The Israelis then broke the Arab defenses with an infantry and armor assault backed by heavy artillery shelling and aerial bombing. Three Arab villages surrendered, and Israeli soldiers and aircraft struck at one of the Arab retreat routes, killing 60 Arab soldiers. The Arabs claimed that the Israelis had massacred Arab civilians, but the Israelis rejected their claims. A United Nations investigation found no evidence of a massacre. Following the operation, the Tel Aviv Haifa Road was opening to Israeli military and civilian traffic, and Arab roadblocks along the route were removed. Traffic along the Haifa Hadra Coastal Railway was also restored. Third phase, October 15, 1948 to Euro March 10, 1949. Israel launched a series of military operations to drive out the Arab armies and secure the northern and southern borders of Israel. Northern Front, Galilee On October 22, the third truce went into effect. Irregular Arab forces refused to recognize the truce, and continued to harass Israeli forces and settlements in the north. On the same day that the truce came into effect, the Arab Liberation Army violated the truce by attacking Minara, capturing the strong point of Sheikh Abed, 
repulsing counterattacks by local Israeli units, and ambushed Israeli forces attempting to relieve Minara. The IDF's Karmali Brigade lost 33 dead and 40 wounded. Munara and Miskovim were totally cut off, and Israel's protests at the UN failed to change the situation. On October 24, the IDF launched Operation Hiram and captured the entire Upper Galilee, driving the ALA and Lebanese army back to Lebanon, and successfully ambushing and destroying an entire Syrian battalion. The Israeli force of four infantry brigades was commanded by Moshe Carmel. The entire operation lasted just 60 hours, during which numerous villages were captured, often after locals or Arab forces put up resistance. Arab losses were estimated at 400 dead and 550 taken prisoner, with low Israeli casualties. Some prisoners were reportedly executed by the Israeli forces. An estimated 50,000 Palestinian refugees fled into Lebanon, some of them fleeing ahead of the advancing forces, and some expelled from villages which had resisted, while the Arab inhabitants of those villages which had remained at peace were allowed to remain and became Israeli citizens. The villages of Iqrit and Biram were persuaded to leave their homes by Israeli authorities, who promised them that they would be allowed to return. Israel eventually decided not to allow them to return, and offered them financial compensation, which they refused to accept. At the end of the month, the IDF had captured the whole Galilee, driven all Lebanese forces out of Israel, and had advanced five miles into Lebanon to the Litani River, occupying 13 Lebanese villages. In the village of Hula, two Israeli officers killed between 35 and 58 prisoners as retaliation for the Haifa oil refinery massacre. Both officers were later put on trial for their actions. Negev Israel launched a series of military operations to drive out the Arab armies and secure the borders of Israel. However, invading the West Bank might have brought into the borders of the expanding state of Israel a massive Arab population it could not absorb. The Negev Desert was an empty space for expansion, so the main war effort shifted to Negev from early October. Israel decided to destroy or at least drive out the Egyptian expeditionary force since the Egyptian front lines were too vulnerable as permanent borders. On October 15, the IDF launched Operation Yov in the northern Negev. Its goal was to drive a wedge between the Egyptian forces along the coast and the Beersheba Hebron Jerusalem road and ultimately to conquer the whole Negev. This was a special concern on the Israeli part because of a British diplomatic campaign to have the entire Negev handed over to Egypt and Jordan, and which thus made Ben Gurion anxious to have Israeli forces in control of the Negev as soon as possible. Operation Yov was headed by the Southern Front commander Yigal Alon. Committed to Yov were three infantry and one armoured brigades, who were given the task of breaking through the Egyptian lines. The Egyptian positions were badly weakened by the lack of a defense in depth, which meant that once the IDF had broken through the Egyptian lines, there was little to stop them. The operation was a huge success, shattering the Egyptian ranks and forcing the Egyptian army from the northern Negev, Beersheba and Ashdod. In the so-called Fallujah pocket, an encircled Egyptian force was able to hold out for four months until the 1949 armistice agreements when the village was peacefully transferred to Israel and the Egyptian troops left. Four warships of the Israeli Navy provided support by bombarding Egyptian shore installations in the Ashkelon area, and preventing the Egyptian Navy from evacuation retreating Egyptian troops by sea. On October 19, a naval battle took place near Mordal, with three Israeli corvettes facing an Egyptian corvette with their support. An Israeli sailor was killed and four wounded and two of the ships were damaged. One Egyptian plane was shot down, but the corvette escaped. Israeli naval vessels also shelled Mordal on October 17, and Gaza on October 21, with their support from the Israeli Air Force. The same day, the IDF captured Beersheba, and took 120 Egyptian soldiers prisoner. On October 22, Israeli naval commandos using explosive boats sank the Egyptian flagship Emir Firak, and damaged an Egyptian minesweeper. On November 9, 1948, the IDF launched Operation Shman to capture the Tegart fort in the village of Iraq Suwaden. The fort's Egyptian defenders had previously repulsed eight attempts to take it, including two during Operation Yov. 
Israeli forces bombarded the fort before an assault with artillery and airstrikes by B-17 bombers. After breaching the outlying fences without resistance, the Israelis blew a hole in the fort's outer wall, prompting the 180 Egyptian soldiers manning the fort to surrender without a fight. The defeat prompted the Egyptians to evacuate several nearby positions, including hills the IDF had failed to take by force. Meanwhile, IDF forces took Iraq's Suwaden itself after a fierce battle, losing six dead and 14 wounded. From 5 to December 7, the IDF conducted Operation Asaf to take control of the western Negev. The main assaults were spearheaded by mechanized forces, while Galani Brigade infantry covered the rear. An Egyptian counterattack was repulsed. The Egyptians planned another counterattack but it failed after Israeli aerial reconnaissance revealed Egyptian preparations, and the Israelis launched a preemptive strike. About 100 Egyptians were killed, and five tanks were destroyed, with the Israelis losing five killed and 30 wounded. On December 22, the IDF launched Operation Harev. The goal of the operation was to drive all remaining Egyptian forces from the Negev, destroying the Egyptian threat on Israel's southern communities and forcing the Egyptians into a ceasefire. During five days of fighting, the Israelis secured the western Negev, expelling all Egyptian forces from the area. Israeli forces subsequently launched raids into the Nitsana area, and entered the Sinai Peninsula on December 28. The IDF captured Umkate and Abu Aigila, and advanced north towards Al-Arish, with the goal of encircling the entire Egyptian expeditionary force. Israeli forces pulled out of the Sinai on January 2, 1949 following joint British-American pressure and a British threat of military action. IDF forces regrouped at the border with the Gaza Strip. Israeli forces attacked Rafa the following day, and after several days of fighting, Egyptian forces in the Gaza Strip were surrounded. The Egyptians agreed to negotiate a ceasefire on January 7, and the IDF subsequently pulled out of Gaza. According to Morris, the inequitable and unfair rules of engagement, the Arabs could launch offensives with impunity, but international interventions always hampered and restrained Israeli Euro unregistered trademark S counterattacks. On December 28, the Alexandroni Brigade failed to take the Fallujah pocket but managed to seize Iraq el Manchia and temporarily hold it. The Egyptians counterattacked, but were mistaken for a friendly force and allowed to advance, trapping a large number of men. The Israelis lost 87 soldiers. On March 5, Operation Avda was launched following nearly a month of reconnaissance, with the goal of securing the southern Negev from Jordan. The IDF entered and secured the territory, but did not meet significant resistance along the way, as the area was already designated to be part of the Jewish state in the UN partition plan, and the operation meant to establish Israeli sovereignty over the territory rather than actually conquer it. The Galani, Negev, and Alexandroni brigades participated in the operation, together with some smaller units and with naval support. On March 10, Israeli forces secured the southern Negev, reaching the southern tip of Palestine, Umrash Rash and the Red Sea and taking it without a battle. Israeli soldiers raised a handmade Israeli flag at 16 o'clock hours on March 10, claiming Umrash Rash for Israel. The raising of the ink flag is considered to be the end of the war. Anglo-Israeli air clashes. As the fighting progressed and Israel mounted an incursion into the Sinai, the Royal Air Force began conducting almost daily reconnaissance missions over Israel and the Sinai. RAF reconnaissance aircraft took off from Egyptian air bases and sometimes flew alongside Royal Egyptian Air Force planes. High-flying British aircraft frequently flew over Haifa and Ramat David Air Base, and became known to the Israelis as the Shoftai Kite. On November 20, 1948, an unnamed RAF photo reconnaissance to Haviland Mosquito of No. 13 Squadron RAF was shot down by an Israeli Air Force P-51 Mustang flown by American volunteer Wayne Peake as it flew over the Galilee towards Hatzer Air Base. Peake opened fire with his cannons, causing a fire to break out in the port engine. The aircraft turned to sea and lowered its altitude, then exploded and crashed off Ashdod. Both of the crew were killed. Just before noon on January 7, 1949, 
4 Spitfire FR-18S from No. 208 Squadron RAF on a reconnaissance mission in the Dur al-Bala area flew over an Israeli convoy that had been attacked by five Egyptian Spitfires 15 minutes earlier. The pilots had spotted smoking vehicles, and were drawn to the scene out of curiosity. Two planes dived to below 500 feet altitude to take pictures of the convoy, while the remaining two covered them from 1,500 feet. Israeli soldiers on the ground, alerted by the sound of the approaching Spitfires and fearing another Egyptian air attack, opened fire with machine guns. One Spitfire was shot down by a tank-mounted machine gun, while the other was lightly damaged and rapidly pulled up. The remaining three Spitfires were then attacked by patrolling IAF Spitfires flown by Slick Goodlin and John McElroy, volunteers from the United States and Canada respectively. All three Spitfires were shot down, and one pilot was killed. Two pilots were captured by Israeli soldiers and taken to Tel Aviv for interrogation, and were later released. Another was rescued by Bedouins and handed over to the Egyptian army, which turned him over to the RAF. Later that day, Four RAF Spitfires from the same squadron escorted by 7 No. 213 Squadron RAF and 8 No. 6 Squadron RAF Hawker Tempests went searching for the lost planes, and were attacked by four IAF Spitfires. The Israeli formation was led by Ezra Wiseman. The remaining three were manned by Wiseman's wingman Alex Jacobs and American volunteers Bill Schroeder and Caesar Dangot. The Tempests found they could not jettison their external fuel tanks, and some had non-operational guns. Schroeder shot down a British Tempest, killing pilot David Tattersfield, and Wiseman severely damaged a British plane flown by Douglas Licorice. Wiseman's plane and two other British aircraft also suffered light damage during the engagement. The battle ended after the British wiggled their wings to be more clearly identified, and the Israelis eventually realized the danger of their situation and disengaged, returning to Hatsa Air Base. Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion personally ordered the wrecks of the RAF fighters that had been shot down to be dragged into Israeli territory. Israeli troops subsequently visited the crash sites, removed various parts, and buried the other aircraft. However, the Israelis did not manage to conceal the wrecks in time to prevent British reconnaissance planes from photographing them. An RAF salvage team was deployed to recover the wrecks, entering Israeli territory during their search. Two were discovered inside Egypt, while Tattersfield's Tempest was found north of Nairim, four miles inside Israel. Interviews with local Arabs confirmed that the Israelis had visited the crash sites to remove and bury the wrecks. Tattersfield was initially buried near the wreckage, but his body was later removed and reburied at the British War Cemetery in Ramla. In response, the RAF readied all Tempests and Spitfires to attack any IAF aircraft they encountered and bomb IAF airfields. British troops in the Middle East were placed on high alert with all leave cancelled, and British citizens were advised to leave Israel. The Royal Navy was also placed on high alert. At Hatsa Air Base, the general consensus among the pilots, most of whom had flown with or alongside the RAF during World War II, was that the RAF would not allow the loss of five aircraft and two pilots to go without retaliation, and would probably attack the base at dawn the next day. That night, in anticipation of an impending British attack, some pilots decided not to offer any resistance and left the base, while others prepared their Spitfires and were strapped into the cockpits at dawn preparing to repel a retaliatory airstrike. However, despite pressure from the squadrons involved in the incidents, British commanders refused to authorize any retaliatory strikes. The day following the incident, British pilots were issued a directive to regard any Israeli aircraft infiltrating Egyptian or Jordanian airspace as hostile and to shoot them down, but were also ordered to avoid activity close to Israel's borders. Later in January 1949, the British managed to prevent the delivery of aviation spirit and other essential fuels to Israel in retaliation for the incident. The British Foreign Office presented the Israeli government with a demand for compensation over the loss of personnel and equipment. UN Resolution 194, in December 1948, the UN General Assembly passed Resolution 194. It called to establish a UN Conciliation Commission to facilitate peace between Israel and Arab states. 
However, many of the resolution's articles were not fulfilled, since these were opposed by Israel, rejected by the Arab states, or were overshadowed by war as the 1948 conflict continued. Weapons, largely left over World War II-era weapons were used by both sides. Egypt had some British equipment. The Syrian army had some French, German, Czechoslovak and British equipment was used by Israel. Aftermath, 1949 Armistice Agreements In 1949, Israel signed separate armistices with Egypt on February 24, Lebanon on March 23, Jordan on April 3, and Syria on July 20. The armistice demarcation lines, as set by the agreements, saw the territory under Israeli control encompassing approximately three-quarters of the prior British-administered mandate as it stood after Transjordan's independence in 1946. Israel occupied territories of about one-third more than was allocated to the Jewish state under the UN partition proposal. After the armistices, Israel had control over 78 percent of the territory comprising former mandatory Palestine or some 8,000 square miles including the entire Galilee and Jezreel Valley in the north, whole Negev in the south, West Jerusalem and the coastal plain in the center. The armistice lines were known afterwards as the Green Line. The Gaza Strip and the West Bank were occupied by Egypt and Jordan respectively. The United Nations Truce Supervision Organization and mixed armistice commissions were set up to monitor ceasefires, supervise the armistice agreements, to prevent isolated incidents from escalating and assist other UN peacekeeping operations in the region. Casualties Israel lost 6,373 of its people, about 1% of its population at the time, in the war. About 4,000 were soldiers and the rest were civilians. Around 2,000 were Holocaust survivors. The exact number of Arab casualties is unknown. One estimate places the Arab death toll at 7,000, including 3,000 Palestinians. 2,000 Egyptians, 1,000 Jordanians, and 1,000 Syrians. In 1958, Palestinian historian F. Al F. calculated that the Arab army's combined losses amounted to 3,700, with Egypt losing 961 regular and 200 irregular soldiers and Jordan losing 362 regulars and 200 irregulars. According to Henry Lawrence, the Palestinians suffered double the Jewish losses, with 13,000 dead. 1,953 of whom are known to have died in combat situations. Of the remainder, 4,004 remain nameless but the place, tally and date of their death is known, and a further 7,043, for whom only the place of death is known, not their identities nor the date of their death. According to Lorenz, the largest part of Palestinian casualties consisted of non-combatants and corresponds to the successful operations of the Israelis. Demographic Outcome, Palestinian Arabs During the 1947-1948 civil war in mandatory Palestine and the 1948 Arab Euro-Israeli war that followed, around 750,000 Palestinian Arabs fled or were expelled from their homes, out of approximately 1,200,000 Arabs living in former mandatory Palestine. In 1951, the UN Conciliation Commission for Palestine estimated that the number of Palestinian refugees displaced from Israel was 711,000. This number did not include displaced Palestinians inside Israeli-held territory. More than 400 Arab villages, and about 10 Jewish villages and neighborhoods, were depopulated during the Arab-Israeli conflict, most of them during 1948. According to estimate based on earlier census, the total Muslim population in Palestine was 1,143,336 in 1947. The causes of the 1948 Palestinian exodus are a controversial topic among historians. After the war, around 156,000 Arabs remained in Israel and became Israeli citizens. Displaced Palestinian Arabs, known as Palestinian refugees, were settled in Palestinian refugee camps throughout the Arab world. The United Nations established UNRWA as a relief and human development agency tasked with providing humanitarian assistance to Palestinian refugees. Arab nations refused to absorb Palestinian refugees, 
instead keeping them in refugee camps while insisting that they be allowed to return. Refugee status was also passed on to their descendants, who were also largely denied citizenship in Arab states. The descendants of refugees are also denied citizenship in their host countries. The Arab League instructed its members to deny Palestinian citizenship to avoid dissolution of their identity and protect their right of return to their homeland. More than 1.4 million Palestinians still live in 58 recognized refugee camps, while more than 5 million Palestinians live outside Israel and the Palestinian territories. The Palestinian refugee problem and debate about the right of return are also major issues of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Palestinian Arabs and their supporters have staged annual demonstrations and commemorations on May 15 of each year, which is known to them as Nakba Day. The popularity and number of participants in these annual Nakba demonstrations has varied over time. During the Second Intifada after the failure of the Camp David 2000 summit, the attendance at the demonstrations against Israel increased. Jews During the 1948 war, around 10,000 Jews were forced to evacuate their homes from Arab-dominated parts of former mandatory Palestine. But in the three years from May 1948 to the end of 1951, 700,000 Jews settled in Israel, mainly along the borders and in former Arab lands, doubling the Jewish population there. Of these, upwards of 300,000 arrived from Asian and North African nations. Among them, the largest group was from Iraq. The remaining came mostly from Europe, including 136,000 from the 250,000 displaced Jews of World War II living in refugee camps and urban centers in Germany, Austria, and Italy, and more than 270,000 coming from Eastern Europe, mainly Romania and Poland. On the establishment of the state, a top priority was given to a policy for the ingathering of exiles, and the Mossad Lelia Bet gave key assistance to the Jewish agency to organize immigrants from Europe and the Middle East, and arrange for their transport to Israel. For Ben-Gurion, a fundamental defect of the state was that it lacked Jews. Jewish immigrants from Arab and Muslim countries left for numerous reasons. The war's outcome had exacerbated Arab hostilities to local Jewish communities. News of the victory aroused messianic expectations in Libya and Yemen. Zionism had taken root in many countries. Active incentives for making Aliyah formed a key part of Israeli policy. And better economic prospects and security were to be expected from a Jewish state. Some Arab governments, Egypt, for example, held their Jewish communities hostage at times. Persecution, political instability, and news of a number of violent pogroms also played a role. Some 800,000 a Euro 1 million Jews eventually left the Arab world over the next three decades as a result of these various factors. Approximately 680,000 of them immigrated to Israel. The rest mostly settled in Europe or the Americas. Israel initially relied on Jewish agency-run tent camps known as immigrant camps to accommodate displaced Jews from Europe and Muslim nations. In the 1950s, these were transformed into transition camps, where living conditions were improved and tents were replaced with tin dwellings. Unlike the situation in the immigrant camps, when the Jewish agency provided for immigrants, residents of the transition camps were required to provide for themselves. These camps began to decline in 1952, with the last one closing in 1963. The camps were largely transformed permanent settlements known as development towns, while others were absorbed as neighborhoods of the towns they were attached to, and the residents were given permanent housing in these towns and neighborhoods. Most development towns eventually grew into cities. Some Jewish immigrants were also given the vacant homes of Palestinian refugees. There were also attempts to settle Jewish refugees from Arab and Muslim countries in Moshevim, though these efforts were only partially successful, as they had historically been craftsmen and merchants in their home countries, and did not traditionally engage in farm work. Historiography After the war, Israeli and Palestinian historiographies differed on the interpretation of the events of 1948, in the West the majority view was of a tiny group of vastly outnumbered and ill-equipped Jews fighting off the mass strength of the invading Arab armies. It was also widely believed that the Palestinian Arabs left their homes on the instruction of their leaders. 
from 1980, with the opening of the Israeli and British archives, some Israeli historians have developed a different account of the period. In particular, the role played by Abdullah I of Jordan, the British government, the Arab aims during the war, the balance of force and the events related to the Palestinian exodus have been nuanced or given new interpretations. Some of them are still hotly debated among historians and commentators of the conflict today. Maps, Operation Sinai December 22, 1948 Euro-January 7, 1949, see also, 1948 Palestinian Exodus, Jewish Exodus from Arab Lands, List of Battles and Operations in the 1948 Palestine War, List of Villages Depopulated During the Arab-Israeli Conflict. List of modern conflicts in the Middle East, arms shipments from Czechoslovakia to Israel 1947-1949, Notes. References. Further reading, History, Eleni, Shlomo. Arab-Israeli Air Wars 1947-82. Osprey Publishing. ISBN 978-1-84176-297-1. The Jewish Brigade, An Army with Two Masters, 1944-45. Sarpedon Publishers. ISBN 978-1-86227-423-5, Ben Ami, Shlomo. Scars of War, Wounds of Peace, The Israeli Arab Tragedy. Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-518158-6, Ben Venisti, Meron. Sacred Landscape. University of California Press. ISBN 978-0-520-23422-2, Flappen, Saima, The Birth of Israel, Myths and Realities, Pantheon Books, New York. Gilbert, Martin. The Arab-Israeli Conflict, Its History in Maps Weidenfeld and Nicholson. ISBN 978-0-297-77241-5, Landis, Joshua. Syria and the Palestine War, Fighting King Abdullah's Great Assyria Plan. Rogan and Schleim. The War for Palestine. 178 Euro 205. Mazala, Nir. Expulsion of the Palestinians, the concept of transfer in Zionist political thought, 1882 Euro 1948, Institute for Palestine Studies, ISBN 978-0-88728-235-5, Pap, Elan, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, Own World Publications, Oxford, England. ISBN 978-1-85168-467-0, Writer, Yitzhak, National Minority, Regional Majority, Palestinian Arabs vs. Jews in Israel, Syracuse University Press. ISBN 978-0-8156-3230-6, Shaleg, Yeah. A Short History of Terror Honorates. Zertel, Edith. Israel's Holocaust and the Politics of Nationhood. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. ISBN 978-0-521-85096-4. Fiction, The Hope by Herman Wauk, a historical novel that includes a fictionalized version of Israel's War of Independence. External links. One of the last surviving founders of IAF recalls mission that stopped Egypt from advancing on Tel Aviv. Pictorial History, Air Force Volunteers. Overview of the 1948 Israeli War of Independence on YouTube, video footage of the Israeli Independence War on YouTube, resources modern period greater than 20th center. History of Israel State of Israel The War's War of Independence The Jewish History Resource Center. Project of the Dinah Center for Research in Jewish History, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, about the War of Independence, United Nations, System on the Question of Palestine, Summary of Arab-Israeli Wars, History of Palestine, Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, Palestinian Viewpoint Concerning the Context of the 1948 War, 
the BBC on the UN Partition Plan, the BBC on the Formation of Israel, Israeli War of Independence, an autobiographical account by a South African participant, Israel and the Arab Coalition. In 1948, I have returned. Time Magazine. March 15, 1948. Retrieved October 31, 2009. A War for Jerusalem Road. Time Magazine. April 19, 1948. Retrieved October 31, 2009. A.